All right. Well, we're back for another show today. I've got Cameron Kovac. He is the president of the Florence Red Wolves uh, collegiate wooden bat team in Florence, South Carolina, a place I have been to many times and driving past <laughs> on, what is that? I-95. 95 uh, and I-20, two interstates. Usually people will just, just pass through Florence um, and just stay at one of our local hotels. Not a lot of people stay long, but <laughs> yeah. How's it going, Cameron? Things are going well. How are you, Andrew? Doing good, man. Thanks for thanks for joining me. I'm glad that uh, we were able to connect. You know, I think I think you got a cool background just from you know the collegiate space to you know kind of uh, you know the agency side. I'll call it, even though it was still with some teams and organizations, uh, all the way into something I want to learn more about is collegiate wooden bat because I've seen the explosion of it really over the last few years where. Um, Teams are popping up and, you know, you've seen some professional teams turn into collegiate teams and, you know, the business model, um, it just looks like it's set up for success from the beginning, you know, right. and um, I think it's great for these small, mid, mid-sized communities and, um, you know, the level of play is kind of shocked me how good it was. I was thinking yeah. it was going to be not that great. So, um, but Cameron, let's, let's start off with just, you know, kind of walk me through your career, you know, where, where are you from? And then, you know, take me until we get to Florence. Sure. Absolutely. So I was born in Columbus, Ohio, okay. um, lived there for a little bit and then grew up literally all over the place. You know, my dad was a high level executive and he liked to move us around, which got me ready for the, the sports industry. Yeah. I'm sure you can attest to it. Well. <laughs> if you follow my resume, you can see that I've been kind of everywhere. Um, undergrad, I went to Niagara University, so small Catholic uh, private school in uh, outside Niagara Falls, New York. I got my sport management degree there. While there, they had us intern for, I say had us intern for 400 hours. Looking back, it was uh, definitely uh, great that they had us do that um, to get some you know actual experience in the field. So while I was there, I interned for the Salem Kaiser Volcanoes, short, short season single A baseball team in uh, Kaiser Volcanoes. Yeah. How'd you get there? I mean, that's like so, all the entire question. way across the country. Right. So actually for high school, I was in the state of Oregon. So okay. I actually went to high school in Salem. So it's really, you know, high right. all the way to Niagara Falls, which um, my father went to Niagara University uh, back in the 60s. He's actually from Niagara Falls, Ontario. He's Canadian and went there and um, just took a campus visit and was really impressed by the faculty, the staff, um, the sport management program that they had. So um, from there, at, also at Niagara, interned for a golf course, um, resorts. Um, I think I also interned at a water park, just kind of try to get some credible experience all over the place. Cause I, you know, I, I always knew I wanted to work in sports, but, um, so do a lot of people and they don't really know what exactly that means. So I'm um, really doing some soul searching and trying to, you know, see what exactly in sports I wanted to do. How, how important do you think that is when you are looking for staff now? I mean, because I think it's I think it's great to see multiple internships, especially in different, you know, either, um, you know, sports or different departments, just to kind of, like you said, figure out what you want to do. Yeah, I think it's I think it's crucial. Um, I think that that uh, practical experience is just so important in our industry, in addition to. Um, what they learn in the classroom because it's it's nothing can substitute for practical experience in the industry. Um, I don't care what school you go to, what teacher you, you you learn from. It's it's all about the practical experience. Yeah, a little different than just reading out of a book. So exactly. <laughs> very different from reading out of a book. Um, I can definitely attest to that. Um, nothing ever goes by the book. Um, if it did, um, things would be a lot different. <laughs> when you were doing these internships, did you kind of have that aha moment on like what you wanted to do career wise or, you know, I, I don't think I did, you know, I still think that I wanted to work in sports, but I, I honestly, I still think I was very much in the realm of, I don't know what in sports and I, I don't know really, you know, what exactly I want to do. Um, cause everyone's like, well, I want to be in marketing. It's like, well, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> um, so I don't want to call a hundred people. That's what that means. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, from, 
my undergrad when I graduated, it was in 2011. So the job market was pretty atrocious, you know, after the financial um, collapse and um, there's just not a lot of jobs out there. I was competing with a lot of people who had five, 10 years experience. Um, so I decided to go to grad school, went to Mississippi state, um, got my master's there, had to do another internship. So backtracking a little bit when I was at Niagara, I had the opportunity to volunteer for the Super Bowl in 2010. Nice. Um, so we went for, I think it was for a week and did a lot of the events leading up to the game and then, uh, volunteered with NFL on location. So hospitality event that they do, um, in the stadium on game day. So that was in Miami, obviously like phenomenal experience. Um, just another thing to add to the resume as well. And leads me to when I was at Mississippi state, I had to do a, a semester long internship and my professor at Niagara got me connected with the Super Bowl host committee in new Orleans. Um, so I linked on with them, the Greater New Orleans Sports Foundation, and was able to become an intern with their uh, volunteer services department. So basically what we had to do there was recruit, uh, I think it was around 8,000 volunteers and manage them and direct them and basically schedule them uh, for about the two weeks of activities um, leading up to the Super Bowl and then obviously the Super Bowl as well. Um, so that got me, you know, a lot of Great experience, made a lot of great connections there. Um, and then from Mississippi State, I actually left the industry because um, I couldn't find a job. So um, worked in the retail world, uh, worked for Target um, as a like team leader, um, you know, management trainee, whatever you want to call it. Um, really something to A, pay the bills and B, I, I just think it's so important that um, while yes, we all want to work our dream job. We all want to work in sports. Um, if you're not doing that at that moment, you, you gotta be doing something. Um, yeah. and that was my something. And honestly, the, the experience there being able to manage people, um, and people from all walks of life when it's retail, um, definitely gave me a lot of invaluable skills that, um, I, I use now I used when I was at, you know, with the Alliance, with the XFL, um, it's all about the management of people. So about a, I think it was about a year into the target job, I saw that the Aspire group was getting the contract at the University of Texas at Austin. So I was you know, reading into it. I was like, all right, you know, it said that they were going to staff up and hire around 30 people um, for their ticket sales and service department. So applied for that job. You know, I talked to um, Carly Rieger, um, who was the manager of service and retention, talked to Max Cozen, who's the new sales manager. Um, and was hired as a service and retention consultant. So basically my job there was, I had a book of business of around, I wanna say 1300 accounts uh, for University of Texas. I think it was about $4 million in the book of business where I had to, for lack of a better term, become their best friend and <laughs> get them to spend more, get them to donate more, get them to buy other sports. Um, and I think that's where I had my aha moment and realized, Hey, I'm actually pretty good at this. So, um, you know, continue to develop there in the Aspire group. And I, I know you've talked to, to Bill Fagan in one of your earlier episodes. Um, they do such a great job of, uh, mentoring and developing and training and getting people to, um, from the consultant, the sales seat to leadership. So um, throughout the years of training, you know, I went from service or retention consultant to a senior service or retention consultant about 18 months or so. And then I saw that, you know, the Aspire Group is consistently getting new contracts as they do. Um, they got University of Delaware and Newark, Delaware. I was like, you know, talking to my managers. I was like, I think I'm ready. You know, do you think I'm ready? And they're like, yeah, definitely, you know, put in that and, and uh, go interview for it. So um, talked to them, interviewed with, um, the university of Delaware folks and, uh, CJ Wider, who was actually a regional, uh, VP for the Aspire group at the time. I think he's with the Grizzlies now. And, um, they liked me they gave me the offer. I went up there. They had a somewhat of an outbound ticket sales, um, effort is really, they had one group salesperson and really didn't know exactly, um, the ins and outs and didn't really have a good strategy. So was really brought in to implement the Aspire Group, um, their you know, policies, procedures, and really build out that outbound ticket sales uh, effort. So when I started, it was just me. So selling manager, which is, um, 
I feel like selling manager is such a oxymoron. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's tough um, because you have to wear your manager hat. And then you also have to be like, all right, you know, I've done all my managerial duties. Now I got to hammer out 60 outbound calls or, you know, 80 outbound calls just to actually get some traffic because I don't have any sales reps. <laughs> so from there, you know, we, we did a really good job. We started proving ourselves and I made the case and was finally able to hire a sales consultant. So like about a year in, we grew that property to myself and a sales consultant, which definitely helped out and helped um, help that department get bigger and better. And um, they're doing some good things now. Um, from there, I noticed that um, so my parents had moved to San Antonio, Texas. I had family in San Antonio, Texas. I noticed that UTSA, University of Texas, San Antonio, was looking for a director of ticket sales and service. So it's like, hmm, that could be great. So I put my name in the hat, um, talked to them, talked to Brandon Raphael, who was their senior associate, athletic director of development ticket sales, um, really understood what they were looking to do, which was it was interesting. They were actually going the other way. So they had um, they ha were in a third party. Um, they had a third party doing their ticket sales. They were going in-house. So while at my other stops, Texas and Delaware, we're going the other way. We're going in-house to outsource. We're going to outsource to in-house. Um, so it's cool to go the other way. Um, luckily, Brandon has a extensive um, you know, experience in ticket sales. And he's actually the current uh, team president for the Making Bacon. And actually the reason why I'm in Florence today. So fun nice. fact. Um, so he, he, he knows ticket sales and he knows what to do and he knows strategy and he knows tactics. So he brought me in and with him, we, we built out a, a department. I had four uh, sellers, um, two focusing on B2B, one focusing on groups and one focus, focusing on inside sales. So did really well. We grew revenues. Everything was going great. Um, and then about a year into it, that's when the Alliance of American Football and us that they were bringing a team to San Antonio kind of piqued my interest. It's like, hey, that like, looks kind of cool. Um, interviewed for that or applied for that talked to uh, Murray Khan, who was the senior vice president of ticket sales. And um, I like to joke with him. I think it was the most extensive interview I know I've ever gone through. I think it was like two weeks of like interviews back and forth with him and talked to Mitch Reed, who was another VP in the league. Um, I know he did a lot of vetting and talked to the eventual team president for the team. And they, you know, they were doing a lot of things and a lot of uh, uh, vetting of me to yeah. see if I was the right person for the role. Did you know Murray before that, or was that kind of your first uh, meeting with him? So I, I knew of Murray. Obviously, everyone in the industry knows of Murray. Um, I did not know him personally um, until you know I started interviewing with him, started talking to him. Um, now we're we're great friends, and you know Murray is. I can't say anything. You know Murray's the best. Um, he's he's so great um, and does a lot for a lot of people. Um, but um, yeah, so. Obviously, um, when I was in San Antonio with the Commanders, we did a we did a great job, and we we, we led the league in attendance. I think we averaged, I want to say, north of twenty five thousand a game. Um, number one in ticket revenues. I mean, everything was going great, and of course, and uh, I think it was late March, early April. I don't know, try to block it out, maybe PTSD. Um, of course, the the league collapses, and um, very. Interesting. I, I know you talked to Mike Waddell too. I'm one of these, um, and he was the president of Orlando. Um, very surreal experience. Um, you know, basically you, you come in and in San Antonio, we were doing so well. So it really just hit us in the face. Cause it's like, we're selling all these tickets. We had one more game against uh, the Memphis express and they had Johnny Menzel at quarterback. It was going to be the CBS game leading into the final four pregame show. We had sold about 40,000 tickets already. Um, it was basically going to be the hallmark game for the league. And like, people were going to see like, oh man, this thing's legit. And of course they don't have funding. You know, it's basically, you know, all, uh, all lie or whatever. And then we get an email from, uh, from the chairman of the board at the Alliance of American football saying that, you know, the league's dissolved and we're, we're all gone. So, um, very, very, um, interesting experience. I know it, it did a lot for, uh, my growth and it did a lot for everyone else that had to go through it. Um, because it was just, it was so tough. And honestly, if anyone from the Alliance of American Football applies for any job that I'm hiring for in the future, I talk to them because I know what they went, I want to know what they went through. Um, it's tough. You know, I'm starting a league and I was hired in September and our first game was in February. Um, and they were, you know, looking for an average 25,000 a game. 
Yeah, and that's honestly not enough time to really do it. And yeah. what you guys did is very impressive. And I, I would definitely be very proud of what you guys accomplished. Um, you know, I thought from an outsider perspective, um, you know, I definitely thought that uh, it was well done. And, you know, had it been properly funded, I mean, it'd probably still be here. Um, but how was that adjustment going from the collegiate side to, you know, a pro team and, you know, the pro team obviously being, you know, a spring league that's, that's new. Um, what kind of challenges did you come across launching that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think it's, I mean, it was great. I mean, going to the pro world is, it's awesome. There's a lot less red tape college world. There's a ton of red tape. Um, you know, let's be real. The, the donors really run the ship. I mean, it's, just, it's the reality. Um, pro sports, as long as you have a great owner, um, which, you know, the Alliance, the exception of the funding issue, you know, they had great leadership in place and I feel like they had some good people in place and some smart people, um, people in pro sports, they they run it like a business, which at the end of the day, that's how it should be run. And that's how the successful athletic departments run it. They run it like a business. Um, so going to the pro world, it was, it was awesome. I mean, that's, that's honestly why I'm still in it. Um, you have a lot more freedom. You can get a lot more creative. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I struggle to find challenges on the pro side. There are a ton of challenges on the collegiate side. How was it? Um, I take it that the staff was maybe a little bit larger as well for you. You know, was that like your largest staff that you've managed? It was. So with the Alliance, I had a manager of ticket operations. I had a ticket sales manager. I had a senior account executive. Then I had four regular account executives. So I think I had seven and I had an intern. So I had eight. Um, so we had a very large staff. Um, admittedly, probably a little bit too big for that level too, probably. Um, just based on the amount of leads, um, you know, my, my top seller did, I think he did around like $350,000 in revenue. So they were, they were doing okay. It was just, um, you're running, our leads were running dry towards the end. Um, right. So that, I think that was the, uh, the tough one is the leads. And obviously like when everything was going down with the Alliance, the, being a manager and being a leader of the people, when, um, honestly, you don't know what's going on. Right. It's, it's really tough. And, you know, when I went to the XFL world as well, it, it happened again when that kind of went down, you know, obviously way different circumstance with COVID. Um, but you know, the toughest thing to do is to look your people in the eyes when you don't know what's going on and right. keep their morale high and basically, you know, say, Hey, like we're doing it. We're, we're still fine. We're playing on Saturday. Like keep it right. up when, you know, they're getting, I mean, shoot, when I was at the Alliance, sometimes, you know, bill collectors would call in our inbound phone line or like, you know, you had stuff like that. So like, you know, keeping the morale up and keeping, but everybody convinced that, Hey, we need to keep going. Cause this yeah. is, you know, we're doing well. It, it can be tough. Were you also a seller in that role as well, or just leadership? Just leadership. Um, yeah, obviously I, I would help on the bigger stuff. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, uh, strictly leadership. So you, you get the bad news and now you're just, now you're out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I take it there was no severance because no money. Know, <laughs> there was no money. Right. Right. So, so what's going through your mind now? And are you just kind of like, are you in panic mode? Are you like, okay, let's regroup? You know, it, it's it's a lot it's a lot of panic mode, right? Because you're you're like, holy crap, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I I I was on cloud nine because working that job starting a football league in seven months work a lot of hours. So it was a lot of like 13 hour, 14 hour days. And um, we saw the crowds and we're like, Oh man, this is great. People are wearing our merchandise in the city. Um, we had a local beer uh, made for our team. So like people were pumped. People loved us. We had our own fan group too. I think there was all, like, we had a fan group on uh, Facebook that was like 9,000 people on it. I think it's still active today wow. too. So like we were, we were popular. So when we got cut at the knees, um, it's a lot of like, oh man, what do I do now? So, um, from there it was, um, obviously reaching out to my, my people as well. Cause they're in the same shoot. I mean, our whole staff, um, the whole league, um, and there's a lot yeah. of talented people in the league. So, um, you know, it was a lot of panic and then a lot of regrouping and then a lot of, you know, what do I do now? 
um, which was, okay, you know, I need to put myself out there. I need to start networking. I need to start applying. Um, I need to start planting seeds with people. And so how long did it take for you to find your next opportunity? So for the XFL for Elevate, I noticed that, um, you know, I'm, I'm probably crazy for thinking this for wanting to go to spring football again after what happened. But um, <laughs> You're uh, not the only person, though. That's the, that's the sad, you know, there's there was a lot of people that right. had that happen twice now. Exactly. So, you know, I saw that the XFL was um, outsourcing with Elevate Sports Ventures. Didn't really know a lot about Elevate Sports Ventures, uh, but started researching and looking up and trying to see who was in charge of that. And I think that was around like mid-May. So about a month after all this went down. And um, I found who was um, basically the contact for all this, uh, Jamie Brandt, who was um, the vice president for ticket sales for the 49ers as well. And he ended up being um, just the chief of the project for the XFL. Um, so I worked my network, um, Max Cozen, who was the new sales manager at University of Texas. So you know, way back in my career, um, actually knew him and connected me. So shot an email to him. I got a call with Jamie. Um, of course, Jamie was fascinated with my experience in spring football because they were about to, you know, embark on their own journey. So, um, and then from there, it was a ton of back and forth because um, the city that I wanted to go to, Dallas, didn't have a team president. And I was ultimately told, you know, no team president. Um, we're not going to make any decisions. And honestly, if the team president doesn't like you, then you're not the guy anyways. Um, so while that's going on, I'm obviously looking around, uh, for other jobs, but I, I kept the conversation going with Jamie and then, um, he put me in touch with Mike DiMarino, who ultimately was my boss, uh, with the XFL. He was the head of sales for the league. So all the directors fed into Mike, um, had a great conversation with him. I think that was probably in June. So this kept going. Um, and then they had me drive to Dallas to meet with, um, uh, Derek, who was uh, one of the league personnel people uh, in person. So I talked to him. I think it was like a 10 minute meeting. So I drove, you know, four hours for 10 minutes. Uh, but, <laughs> you got to get the damn job after that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. And then finally, um, they hired a team president, uh, Grady Raskin, who was the, um, so the vice dog. president for sponsorship sales for the Dallas Stars. Yeah. Um, very well known in the Dallas area. So. He got it. He met me at like a Whole Foods um, on like a random day or whatever. So I drove up, met with him, um, had a good meeting and then was offered the job later that day um, and then off to the races. So, um, you know, that while well, the Alliance one, it was a lot of interviews, but it happened very quickly. This one took a while, um, which, you know, it's it's, it's, you know, what's that? I said that gets frustrating. It's like, you know. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're in limbo right now, as it is, you don't have a position. And exactly. And you know, it, it, I kept talking to him, kept talking to Mike and Jamie. It's like, hey, like, what's what's going to happen here? Because you know, it's like I want this role, but you know, honestly, it's you know the tick tock. You know, the clock is ticking on it. Well, yeah. Not only that, it, like you need as much time as you can to put it all together. Exactly. Yep. Because yeah, yeah, I mean, so you know, last time, yeah. um, you know, when the runway uh, gets shorter, so to speak, um, it gets harder and harder to uh, build a staff and uh, you know get everything done that we want to get done. How long does that did that process take, roughly? You think? Uh, from first interview to hiring, mm -hmm. uh, probably two and a half, three months. Wow, yeah. that is that is a good amount of time. Yeah, it was a while, especially because, you know, I was told from the get go, which I I believe they weren't lying. You know, they had a lot of other things come to play, you know, that they want to move fast, which that ended up being fast for them. You know, when you're a, when you're a third party and, um, you know, it's the XFL and then Elevate, you know, there's a lot of going back and forth between the two on yeah. all right, what exactly do we want to do? Like, who do we want to hire? Who do we want to place where? And so on, so speak. So. I think I was the either the first or second director hi hired. Um, Tom French, who was the New York director, he was hired about the same time that I was. Yeah, and and sometimes it's they just they're dealing with all the teams too. So it's like you know it seems like hey this is pretty easy let's let's keep going and then they're dealing with you know hundreds of positions that they're probably filling and 
Right. Yeah. I think it was eight directors and then um, I think six reps per market to start. So, um, and uh, they had teamwork online help a lot, um, help us a lot with screening interviews because a lot of us weren't hired um, when they were trying to, you know, I guess get the candidate pool a little bit streamlined for us so we can come into, you know, maybe 20 to 30 people to interview versus you know, hundreds. What, what kind of takeaways did you have from both leagues? Like what, what were kind of some of the things that you have taken with you? Like you thought, man, this is just, you know, a great idea or a great process, or is there been anything like that from the two leagues that has kind of stuck with you? Yeah, I think ultimately the spring football can work and I think it will work. It, it would have worked if COVID didn't happen. We hit all of our ticket sales goals and I think sponsorship goals were getting hit. Uh, revenue goals were getting hit. Um, obviously it's just no league can really withstand something like that. I mean, it, it, I think it ended us what we didn't play three or four weeks. So like that's, it's a lot of revenue that we have to just give back to people. So it, it can work. Um, it just, you have to have the right, the right markets, um, which yeah. Some of the markets were right for the Alliance. Some of the markets were right for the XFL. Some a, few from here, a few from there. And exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like if you like get cities like San Antonio and like Orlando and like St. Louis and Seattle and you know, potentially Dallas, I mean, you can definitely, definitely do it. And then at the end of the day, whoever's going to pull this off needs to, they're going to lose a lot of money in the first couple of years. I mean, that's just the reality of it. And just the amount of, money in running a football team, let alone a league is a lot. Um, especially with like, just look at the salaries, for instance, I know with the Alliance, we were paying like 75 grand a player. Um, and football rosters are huge. So, yeah. um, that's a lot and just salaries. And then look at, look, look at the building leases, you know, each, each city has to pay a certain amount of money to play wherever they are. None of these teams are going to own a facility. Yeah. Um, because it's just, you know, you play 10 weeks. So it doesn't make sense. So like, do you think you would give that another, you know, thought like, okay, Hey, in two years, you know, XFL's back. Hey, uh, Cameron, we've got a position. Oh, me personally. I, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, uh, you're, you're, you're that. You'll be a fan maybe, but right, not, I'll, I'll be a fan. Um, it would have to be, you know, one great offer. Um, but, um, I feel like the two times that I went through it, you know, I was honestly, it's, it's, it's tough to bring like a significant other through it too, you know, <laughs> like, um, pretty traumatic experience to lose your job once, let alone twice. Um, granted, like I, the whole pandemic thing, it's, it's, um, you know, everybody went through it. So I kind of like chucked it up to, yeah. you know, once in a lifetime thing, but the Alliance experience was just so tough, um, that, you know, it's, you have to be convinced that. Um, the league is going to be there to stay. So, which I it's they hard. Both, they were going to say that. Yeah, I so. that from them from the beginning. Right. You know, so it's like you know, yeah. How do you and and there's really, it doesn't even matter if it's billionaire owners that you know own a, it. At the end of the day, if they feel like they want to shut it down, it, it's going to get shut down. Yeah, I mean, Vince McMahon was worth you know I don't know what three or four billion. I mean, like he's, he's yeah obviously in his position because he's smart and he's a business person. So if he looks at it and goes, okay, he probably knew that there was no chance they were going to play in 2021 either. So he's like, all right, if I maintain this and keep everybody on staff and keep this up and running, why, you know, it doesn't make sense. So you get, you know, again, kind of, you know, lose out on your position this time due to COVID both times really not due to your own fault. That's the right. tough part for me. Like hearing, you know, it's like, if, if you just were, you know, not getting it done, that's one thing. But, like, you were with a successful team, you know, you guys were doing well, and that's the frustrating part. Hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people have lost their jobs due to no fault of their own. Right. That's, that's tough. Um, but what were you thinking after that second time with COVID? I mean, what was going through your head? Like, damn it, I'm done with sports. I'm like yeah. – um, I probably should have thought like that. No, um, real job. <laughs> right. So it was, it was interesting because, you know, honestly with the XFL, we had been working from home for about, I want to say four to six weeks when everything happened. So that whole experience was traumatic in itself because, um, on the elevate side, um, just 
due to the way it is and like legalities, we weren't kept in the loop fully on what exactly was going on. So we didn't know that the league had collapsed until officially until after everyone else like had their call with the commissioner and like they were told, you know, the league's gone. So of course, like we're on Slack and we see all these messages like, you know, it's been great. Here's my contact information. And we're like, huh? And I'm like, my staff called me like, Hey, what's going on? I see all these like goodbye messages. So I get on like a FaceTime call with them. Like I honestly, guys, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to try to find out, you know, obviously like we know what happened and we had a call with elevate. They let us know what happened, you know, from there, um, you know, honestly, it was in the midst of pretty much everyone getting furloughed or laid off. So sports industry wise, it was just tough. Um, you know, luckily I had a pretty good network built up. So a couple of people reached out to me, including, um, Brandon Raphael for this current position, um, in Florence, you know, he, he started playing the seed and talking to me about like, Hey, we're talking about, uh, picking up another team in the league. It's in Florence. They're going to get a new stadium in 2022. You know, we think you'd be great, you know? Um, so I kept that conversation going, but also kept, um, you know, looking and to start looking outside the industry too. Cause it, you know, I don't know what's going to happen for sports, but, um, honestly sports, the sports industry within itself is it's my passion. And, um, I, from looking at jobs outside of it, I honestly don't know where I would go. And, um, like, cause you know, I, I have fun at this jobs and I don't think I would have fun, you know, going and selling tech products or medical devices or, or whatever. Um, so. Well, I, I can tell you this. I, um, you know, I've owned teams most of my career. I, I most recently was an employee up in uh, Fredericksburg with the Nationals minor league baseball team. Okay. And, uh, you know, ended up moving back to Florida in August, but um, I, I bought a uh, an insurance franchise. Oh, like, okay. we'll, we'll we'll do that, and uh, you know, bought two locations so that if I do get another opportunity somewhere outside of Florida then we can do it and my wife will run it and, and this and that. I can tell you it's boring as hell. I, 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 <laughs> like, there's zero percent of me that wants to, you know, to, to work that. So, I mean, the ultimate goal is for me not to, um, but um, like you, it's like you, you want to be in that, you know, where, where's your passion? You know, I feel like I never work. You, you're not able to get through those 12, 13, 14 hour days um, long term if you don't enjoy it, if right. You don't enjoy what you're doing. And, and, uh, so, I mean, for me, I've, I, I feel like I've really never worked, you know, throughout my career and it's, it's important. And that's what brings us to, you know, the Florence Red Wolves. I, a couple people have been approaching me about, why don't you just, why don't you do a collegiate wooden bat team? Right. And so, um, you know, Going back a step, though, you kind of mentioned it a few times throughout um, kind of your journey is how relationships played into your, you know, career opportunities, your advancement. And I try to really stress that, especially to a lot of these younger um, kids coming out of college and early in their careers is like, number one is you never know, like, you know, hopefully everybody's you know, going up, right. And moving, we're going to move out all over the country. And um, so you want to make sure that you are always putting the best effort forth, even if you don't know stuff. I mean, you know, that can be taught, but you know, effort, you know, if you're just lazy, you're lazy. Right. <laughs> and uh, um, so, I mean, I think those relationships are key to career development just makes it a little bit easier. You know, if you didn't have that, it would be a lot tougher you know, in the business, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, relationships are our industries, I think, and obviously the whole business world is built on relationships. And um, honestly, like I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for relationships and um, being the best, you know, whatever I am at that time, just being the best. So trying to be the best salesperson, trying to be the best selling manager, trying to be the best Alliance American football employee um, and really showing that person that, you know, was managing me or my director or my team president, um, you know, what I can do and what I'm made of. And that ultimately led to, you know, people like, like Murray and like, uh, you know, Vic Gregovitz, who was my team president with the commanders, who was the chief revenue officer for the Cleveland Indians for years. He's president of the Louisville Bats right now. Having people like that, you know, on your side and having people like that, um, that you can call and like, 
um, and the end of the day, they're friends, right? They're friends as well. So, yeah. um, and then obviously when I was in San Antonio working for UTSA, you know, working for Brandon was such a blast. And we had such a great time that one year. And, um, that's why we, you know, we kept in contact and we're, we're, we we're friends and, you know, this opportunity popped up and my name came to the front of his head, I guess. And he called me and, um, and then, you know, I talked to him, I talked to Steve delay, who's, um, Steve delay is actually the managing partner of the team. And then Brandon's a part owner of the team and, um, got the job here and, you know, the rest is, the rest is history. I mean, relationships are, are huge and they will continue to be huge, especially in a market like this. So with the relationships, did you even have to do a face-to-face interview? So, um, great question. I'm trying to think back on what the interview process looked like. You know, it was a lot of like informal phone calls and a little bit back and forth. And they did fly me out to Florence, um, mainly so, you know, my, myself and my wife can see Florence, South Carolina and That's see, perfect. you know, obviously do our end of the, of the job interview and see if it's an area for us. Um, we actually got to meet the, um, the old owner who's actually still on board as a part owner. He's a local attorney here who gave us like a tour of the city and shows around, which, um, you know, obviously sold it to us because we saw Florence. We're like, you know, it's a great area. It's a great area for us to, you know, they're definitely going to embrace the team because it is the team here. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think at the end of the day, I think it was that one, that one face to face on that, um, that plane ride or that trip to Florence. But other than that, it was just a lot of, uh, just a lot of conversations, I guess. Yeah. So what is that like though, to go from, you know, the AAF and XFL to now Florence, South Carolina. Florence is a, uh, what I would consider a small market. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's right off the interstate. What maybe forty minutes to an hour from Myrtle Beach. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it's but they don't have anything. Right. They don't have anything like that's that they could say is is our. You know, they have right. you know red wolves, which which I think is a great rallying point for the community and something that they can embrace. But was that like shell shock? You know, was your wife like, we're crazy. Like we're <laughs> ready for that new, you know, challenge. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Obviously that, that still might happen. Cause we only started in, uh, I think we moved here in like August and I got in place in mid October. So we're still, we're still early. Right. Um, but it, you know, everything's just felt right here. You know, obviously, you know, working in cities like, Austin and cities like San Antonio and Dallas, just big markets, you know, your little fish, big pond here. It's more big fish, small pond, which um, is great. I think we're embracing and it's, it's a really fun end of the job that, um, you know, I got a taste of it in San Antonio with the commanders going to speaking functions and, you know, Vic, my team president did a good job of like taking me along on stuff Um, here that like, that's my most fun part of the job is like going to talk to groups like Kiwanis clubs, rotaries, um, wearing the gear in town and people like starting to recognize the red wolves are starting to get to know people because the whole business community here is so small and intertwined. Oh yeah. Um, so it it was, it is different. Um, but I I love it. I mean, I think it's great. Yeah. And then, you know, moving to a new stadium, uh, in a year, I mean, Mm -hmm. that, you know, that really gives you kind of something. So when you're getting ready to move into a new stadium, so what do you, how do you convince people now to support it? Like, you know, cause you need them to come out still this upcoming season. And, right. uh, you know, obviously you're dangling the nice, um, you know, carrot of the new stadium. Right. So, you know, we're putting in a lot of, um, obviously a lot of the things that, uh, Steve has done in his past. Um, you know, he's been at several minor league teams and, um, with the bacon as well. So, you know, putting in, you know, ticket packages that deliver a lot of value for our people. So we launched a um, five game, all you can eat ticket package here on our five biggest games. So that's been hugely successful so far because they're five biggest games and three of them are fireworks shows. So that's, that's a big part of it. It's just like delivering the value. So how does that, how does that work? Cause I've seen him and I, I think the, the bananas kind of do that too. Yeah, the bananas do as well. Right. Yeah, so like, this is just for five games. So, so, Walk me through that. What's the the price and, you know, kind of how how's it all work from the team side? Sure. So, you know, we view, especially in like in baseball, we just view like season tickets are just, it's almost like a waste to sell them or like advertise them because it's so many games and people never go to all the games. And then the day they might not renew because. Um, they waste money. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So unless you're like a business or like a corporation, like just a regular person or like a regular Joe fan, 
um, it's tough. So we focus on, you know, the, the five biggest games and it's, it's really the, the sellout mentality of, Hey, we want to focus on, you know, five to seven sellouts this year, which is what we're doing here. And how do we do that? That's the five game all you can eat plan. So it's 75 bucks for the plan. So it comes down to like 15 bucks a game, which is great, great value. Cause it's literally all you can eat wow. for people. Um, they also get a hat. Um, they're able to, uh, use a ticket exchange policy. So if they can't make one of the, one of the games, they can swap out for a different game. Um, and then here's the big one, which you mentioned, like, how do we get them invested now for the new stadium? They get priority to pick seats out at the new stadium. So getting them in now and getting them like, Hey, like, you know, buy seats for us now. Like you're going to love the new experience because we're the new ownership. You know, it's going to be a whole new ball game. No pun intended. Um, then you get priority for the new stadium before the general public. And that's how we're doing partnerships as well. So, you know, people can get on board for a partnership this year, they get first right to discussion for 2022, um, which is obviously that's, you know, it's the the brand shiny new toy in town. So everyone was, wants to be a part of it. So we got to take advantage of that for this year because this year is, it's still crucial for us. You know, we, we got a lot to prove, you know, we're coming in here, we're saying a lot of, a lot of things that, um, obviously we've done in different areas, but hasn't been done here. So people need to be convinced, which we understand, um, which is why it's going to be so crucial for us to, uh, you have some good attendance numbers and to, um, deliver. So what's the goal for that, um, $75 pack, the five game pack. So yeah. we're, we're capped out just based on, um, you know, concessions, uh, limitations, because we got to obviously like be able to serve the people because the last thing I want is, you know, sell 2000 of them and then people not be able to get served. Um, so we can sell about 300 of them, um, which we've sold over 200 so far. Nice. Um, they've been on sale since October, which, um, for, you know, a league that starts in late May, I mean, that's pretty, pretty good. Um, and then, you know, we, we may roll out, uh, f a second five game plan with the five next biggest games, um, you know, based on success. Um, and then, you know, with, with that, with the five game plan, the other, you know, realm of attack, so to speak for, you know, increasing attendance is the group sales outreach. So you know, a lot of that comes with you know, the part-time worker that I have right now making group sales calls and, you know, bringing in a group sales intern to make some group sales calls as well. So for, you know, not necessarily your team specific, but can you share kind of like, um, like what kind of size are collegiate um, teams as far as like revenue? Like what's a low end team and kind of like a, you know, a high and, and kind of that, you know, where most teams are? It's a great question. Um, I don't think I can answer that just based on being so new. Okay. Um, I'll probably be able to answer something like that maybe like a year yeah. into it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, like I know, I know what we do here, which you know, I, yeah. of course I can't speak to. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, but put the spot there, um, but you know, the, the business model is just a really good business model if you do it right, just because of the, the team costs that are involved. So, um, while other leagues, you know, you have a lot of, a lot of your cost is, uh, player salaries here, since our players are our amateurs, I mean, they're all college athletes. There is no, no salaries. So we do have to find host families. Um, so local people that will take in the player for the summer. Um, but other than that, it's, you know, it's, you pay your coaching staff, um and some league yeah, fees uh, and like baseball and bats and then you know that, that's that for team costs yeah and i, I saw like a i, I want to say it might have been a podcast that steve was on and he talked about um you know why collegiate wooden bat baseball is a solid you know investment and kind of some of those things you hit and that's from me i've always been in that arena football i've, I've had soccer indoor soccer hockey but uh, going up and working in Fredericksburg with the the baseball team obviously that's affiliated but it kind of opened my eyes to some some things that from a sales and marketing standpoint I could do with baseball I can't do with the others right and, and the collegiate side it's like one of the things we always bitched about over the years is with arena football specifically is workers comp workers <laughs> comp is so expensive for a contact sport like that. And in the state of Florida, you can't get workers comp for athletes, any sport. Um, they don't recognize athletes as uh, employees. And therefore it's like one of the, one of like five categories that's exempt from worker comp law here. But in other cities, I was in up in St. Louis or Ohio, you know, workers comp, I mean, 
usually on the a decent side is maybe 50 cents on the dollar. And then right. when you have a ton of claims, that's that starts. So if you have a hundred thousand in salaries, now you have a hundred thousand in work comp with collegiate, you have neither of those. Right, exactly. Which is great. And you right. have more games. That's right. the challenge with, with arena football. You have seven, eight home games. Um, soccer, 10 to 12 games, so it's a little bit better. Um, but how many games do you guys play in your league? Typically, it's between around 24 to 26 um, in the regular season. So we have 24 games this upcoming year. Um, 12 away? Uh, 24 home games. Okay, so, so- Okay. Yeah, so yeah. the league the league slate, they do 22 home and 22 away. And then if we have some open dates, so like an open Friday, open Saturday, um, I think we had two open, like one open Friday and one open Saturday this year. That's it. All right, we're just going to do inner squad, which is something cool that we can do here. Like we can, you know, Macon had the Macon eggs and the Macon bacon. Or it's the nice. same team. Yeah. Um, so like in Florence, we'll do something similar, which it, it's great because honestly, the fans – uh, for the most part, don't really care who you're following. Playing. The They're following the entertainment. Yeah, exactly. It's all about the entertainment. Um, they don't care who's playing. You know, for the most part, they don't care who's playing unless you have yeah. like some local people or like Clemson or South Carolina. But um, it's all about just all having- you can eat. It's all about the in between inning stunts. It's all about you know just having the fireworks. Just overall fun time, um, which which I think is what's so cool about our league is there's such such an emphasis on entertainment. And that's what, you know, like the bananas do so well and what Macon does so well is that, that entertainment. Yeah, no, it it definitely makes sense. Now, have you had to wear the mascot outfit yet? (laughs) Not yet. No. So I had had my party time to wear it um, for a photo op, but um, I'm sure I will have to get in it eventually. I always recommend you get in that thing first before it's been used for so long. But I guess how long has the team been around? Yeah, so the team's been around for about 18 years. So that thing's been um, I need, need to do one. Tell Steve yeah, we need to do exactly. one. Um they did, you know, they did refresh the logo and the brand, I want to say like six or so years ago. So it's not that old, but you know, just getting around that costume and smelling it, and you're like, I'm not gonna get into that thing. Um and, unless it's dry cleaned. <laughs> specific that you guys are doing now because of covid that you know isn't normal like how are you guys preparing you know so, just selling and, and just being ready to operate yeah i mean like I, i'm operating off of you know the, the thought maybe i'm you know the eternal optimist but i'm operating off the thought that everything's going to be back to normal um and i think that's so crucial when you're selling people especially um your fans you got to be optimistic because the moment that you show doubt is the moment that they showed out and guess what? You're not going to sell anything. Um, so we're optimistic. We're, you know, we're planning as if obviously if we have to adjust, we have to adjust. Um, I think playing is just so crucial for us, especially moving into the new stadium and this team didn't have a season in 2020. They had to cancel. Um, you know, even if we had to put in some health safety or um, things like distancing or whatever, we have to play uh, Macon and Savannah. They actually did play in 2020. I think they played from July through August with, you know, social distancing, reduced capacity. Um, but they did it. You know, if they can do it, you know, we can do it. Um, so hopefully the vaccine gets out there and, you know, more and more people get it. And um, the confidence for people to come out um, returns. Um, so I think it's so important. You know, our stadium it only seats about 1,700. So it's, it's pretty small as it is. Yeah. And then how's the capacity going to be on the new one? The new one's going to be 1600. So very similar. Um, we play at, we actually play at a very nice facility as it is right now. We play at Francis Marion university. They have a um, sports complex uh, with a baseball stadium. That's let's say about five or six years old. Um, seats about, it's about 900 actual seats. And then with grass berms, you can get up to 1700 at our new stadium. I think it's going to be actually like 1600 seats and bleachers and so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, that'll be cool, man. It's fun. I, it's always fun when you have a new uh, a new toy like that up in uh, in Fredericksburg. That's what we were doing is opening a new stadium, and you know, just you know, the community gets excited, and right. you know, it'll be it'll be good, and it's probably better that it won't be ready for this season. You know, let it yeah, let's exactly. get through this and get people back. But I mean, the more and more, I was just at the Tampa Bay Bucks game. Um, you know, in, in Tampa here, people want to get out to events. Yes, and, it is. You know, I think as long as everyone can, you know, be smart, be a little more safe than normal, um, you know, the old days, um, 
you know, we can get back to having live events and sporting events and uh, having fun in the communities. I mean, the, the kids and people need it. I mean, you right. need that entertainment. I mean, that, it's an escape for a lot of people. Um, so can't wait to see all the stadiums packed. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I personally want to get out. I want to go to – like, I'm a big concert guy. Like, I want to go back to concerts. I want to go back to games. I mean, that's – that's the fun thing. And it's like, you don't, you know, you don't know what you lost until you lost or lose it because it's, um, it's been, been tough, but, you know, talking to the people here, um, they have that, that hope, right. They see that, you know, we're coming in here, we're optimistic, we're selling, we have the new stadium. They're like, Hey, like they're back. Uh Um, And Florence, um, as you know, you know, having been into Florence before, they're always looking for stuff to do. And if we can become that, that summer thing to do in town, um, yeah, we're going to be here for a long time. I'm going to be very successful. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to come out and check it out next time I'm driving, uh, between Florida and anywhere up in the East coast, I'm going to stop by and see you. So <laughs> yeah, I'm back about Florence. It's the, uh, halfway point between Miami and New York city. Okay. So <laughs> that's, that's I'm, I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So, uh, my wife's from Baltimore. So it's, you know, it's probably close, you know, for Orlando to, to there as well. So, yep. but we'll check it out. I appreciate you joining me, Cameron. It was great chatting with you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Look forward to kind of following your success up there. Appreciate that. Thanks.